Hello and welcome to the European Resilience Initiative Center video podcast. Today, our guest is Eloise Fayer, who is research fellow at the French Institute of International Relations and head of deterrence and proliferation research program. Her work focuses on nuclear proliferation in Middle East, the impact of emerging technologies and reduction of strategic risk and doctrines of nuclear weapon state. Welcome to this program, Dr. Fayette. Hi, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much that you have joined our program. And uh, we are facing now very uncertain times. The U.S. is thinking who will run the country in the next months. We don't know if there will be uh, more U.S. in NATO. And France remains the only uh, nuclear state in the European Union and one of two nuclear states on the European continent within NATO. Can France replace the United States nuclear umbrella? So I would say that in this current geopolitical context, France is not able uh, to fully replace U.S. extended determinants. And I would even say that France is not willing to. Um, because it's even if Trump uh, comes back in power, uh, we've seen in his first mandates that in fact he didn't withdraw a lot of troops uh, from uh, the European Union and from NATO. And in fact, he loves nuclear weapons. And so we can think and we can hope that uh, he will leave uh, all the nuclear weapons that are deployed in some countries of, uh, of NATO. And in fact, France's goal uh, with its own nuclear deterrence is more to provide, a, let's say, an additional lifeguard and some additional guarantees um, to, as we say, to complicate the strategic calculus of the adversary. And so both in terms of numbers of weapons and political credibility, we know that France is not able to replace the US, um, but we are trying to do as much as France can uh, to provide additional security. When you talk about these limitations of what France can do and fr what France would like to do, what is more decisive here, the absence of technological capacities to expand this nuclear umbrella to the neighbors or the uh, lack of political wellness or political calculations which say, okay, like our nuclear weapons are for ourselves, we cannot risk to extend this nuclear umbrella to other nations because it will increase the risks for mm -hmm. us. Um, so I would say it's both. Um, first, regarding the technical credibility, well, the French nuclear arsenal is undergoing a major uh, modernization. And so I would say it's still credible on the technical side. But of course, uh, the fact that if uh, France keeps the same number of nuclear warheads, but declares uh, it wants to protect more countries, uh, will the countries that we are trying to protect feel reassured, even though we don't increase the number of warheads? So that's the first question. Also, the NATO nuclear deterrence and uh, US extended deterrence work mostly by deploying nuclear weapons abroad. And it's not, it's not something that France is willing to do regarding nuclear non-proliferation, regarding financing, also the kind of weapons that uh, NATO, I mean, that the US is deploying uh, abroad is not the, uh, the kind that France has in stock. And of course, the question of political credibility is even more important um, because right now, so the official French doctrine regarding the Europe, European countries is that the French vital interests, so uh, the one that the president is ready to protect with uh, nuclear weapons and a possible nuclear retaliation, so the president and the official texts uh, say that uh, this uh, Europe, this French vital interests have a European dimension. So basically, it means. I mean, I'm not the president, so I can't translate what he means. Um, but we understand that as the fact that now that the European construction through the European Union, but also NATO, is so advanced. That it's very difficult to think about a situation where the vital interests of, let's say, Sweden or Poland or Romania uh, would be affected, like would be uh, putting in danger the whole existence of the country without the French vital interests being affected too, uh, at the same time or just afterwards. 
And so that's why we, I mean, the president would be ready to use nuclear weapons, to use French nuclear weapons uh, to protect another country if he perceives that there is a connection between the, the survival of this country and France's own survival. And so that's how, that's where the differences between, um, European, I mean, this idea of a French nuclear deterrence and the US extended deterrence. It's because the US are supposed to protect European countries, NATO countries, even though the attack is not on them, even though they are not threatened uh, by an attack on, uh, let's say, again, Poland or, or Romania. And so that's why, in fact, France considers itself as more credible than the US uh, to protect European countries. It's because we are directly involved, and that's not the case of the US. That is a very interesting, uh, interesting analysis of these differences, and I absolutely adore this ambiguity in the word uh, European dimension. Because uh, how you do, how do you define uh, Europe? Is it geographical continent? Is it uh, the European Union? Uh, what parts of this piece of land are inside Europe which are not? Where is the eastern border of Europe? Um, if I'm not mistaken, President de Gaulle said uh, that Europe goes up to the Ural Mountains, and that is uh, how Europe is being defined by geographists, for example. And once again, is uh, Ukraine a part of this European dimension of France's interest in Baltic states and other countries? That is absolutely fascinating, this ambiguity in the world. But bringing that to a very practical, uh, practical dimension, when we say uh, European dimension, uh, can we presume that, let me say, Moldova and Ukraine are included in this, into this dimension? Um, I would say, unfortunately, it's not for me to say, and it's really in the mind of the, of the president, but it's, you know, the negative dimension of this ambiguity, in that for countries to feel reassured, you, you need to commit to them and to show them that, yes, you are going to protect them, um, but at the same time, if it's very important for nuclear deterrence also to maintain ambiguity, so the adversary... Uh, it have to, co to be convinced that if he or she attacks uh, a country, he might face a nuclear response. But for the moment, from what I understand of the nuclear um, French doctrine, that I would say, unfortunately, um, it's limited to, I would say, NATO and European Union uh, countries. So Baltic states, for sure. Uh, Finland, Sweden, um, but I would say maybe for the moment, uh, Ukraine and Moldova might not be integrated in this idea of uh, European um, European dimension of the French uh, French vital interests. Um, even though the recent um, like uh, French Ukraine uh, relation has increased, and in the text, in the guarantee and the agreement that has been signed between the two countries, there is this Id idea of an active deterrence, uh, if I remember correctly. And so it has, uh, let's say, underlying nuclear weapons um, dimension. But of course, again, it's really up to the president and up. I mean, to the degree of escalation and risk he's willing to take. Thank you for this analysis. And before we go further into details of nuclear proliferation and the security situation worldwide, including the Middle East, don't forget to like, to share and to subscribe to this channel. And we are talking now with a nuclear proliferation expert, Elise Fayet, who is a research fellow at the French Institute of International Relations. Um, we have now a situation with uh, Russian cooperation with Iran, which is nothing new. It took place since decades, and the Russians uh, were totally involved in the uh, Iranian energy program and in Iranian military program. But now we read new signs which say that Iran is very close to creation of its own nuclear device, as some people say, who are familiar with the issue. How is this situation changes the balance of powers worldwide? And what is the role of Russia in proliferation process? Um, so, yeah, the Iranian nuclear dossier, as we say, is uh, very fascinating. 
and a bit depressing at the same time. Um, so for sure, what we know of the Iranian nuclear program uh, these days, it, as you say, has never been so close to um, acquire or develop a nuclear device. So not necessarily, necessarily a nuclear weapon that they could, you know, send to their closest enemies, uh, but at least something to detonate and to demonstrate. Um, but at the same time, they never said and they never showed the political resolve uh, to develop a nuclear weapon. And so I would say that these, nowadays they have all the advantages of nuclear deterrence. Uh, no one really does to attack, to fully attack their territory. Uh, they're able to attack their neighbors, as we've seen with Israel, uh, quite freely. And they have this huge um, ballistic missile program, their uh, proxies in the Middle East, this relationship with Russia, with China. And so they have all the advantages of nuclear deterrence without the bomb. Um, and it's the gift of, you know, what we call a threshold state. Um, so I would say that for the moment, they don't need a nuclear weapon. And so I, I don't think they would cross uh, the threshold, at least for the next years, even though it will depend, of course, on the internal, internal domestic situation uh, in Iran and the, tra the transition after Ayatollah Khamenei dies. Um, but for sure, their growing relation with Russia and with China um, really helped them, but more in a like, diplomatic and almost normative way. Um, because we have to remember that the GCPOA, so the famous agreement of, on the uh, Iranian, um, Iranian nuclear program, so signed in um, 2015, um, so was signed by three European countries, so France, uh, the UK and Germany, also signed by the US and also, of course, by Russia and China. And their role, their participation was very important uh, to guarantee that the agreement uh, would stay. And uh, they provided, uh, let's say, sanction relief uh, to, uh, to Iran. But nowadays, because of the war in Ukraine, it's impossible to bring back uh, Russia and also China uh, to the table of negotiations. And they see that they have, let's say, the higher ground of uh, all negotiations and in this new international order they want to uh, promote. And that's why, I mean, it's one of the reasons um, why this uh, nuclear dossier is almost impossible to solve. It's because the U.S. are the original sinners, I would say, because Donald Trump withdrew uh, from the GCPOA in, 20, um, in 2018. And so... Iran was able to say, hey, but we respected everything. And you see, it's the bad Western countries that withdrew uh, from the from the GPOA. And so I would say that the West lost all credibility trying to uh, refrain Iran to fully enrich and to continue its politics of, let's say, aggressivity uh, in, the, in, in the Middle East. And the role of Russia and China is essential, I would say, not in helping Iran to really proliferate um, because I don't think that either Russia or China have an interest in uh, having a new nuclear weapon state in the world because it can have very destabilizing effects, um, but at least trying to help the Iranian regime to survive for sure. That is what we uh, are observing now with the uh, official and non-official nuclear states or aspiring uh, nuclear states. Uh, and the the situation with Russian attack against Ukraine uh, has demonstrated that the states which have nuclear bombs, nuclear missiles, are much more protected against any intervention in their uh, policy than others. And now what we see that Ukraine, which has abandoned its nuclear arsenal and given it up to Russia, is being under attack by nuclear power Russia in alliance with uh, illegally nuclear weapons North Korea, which supplies Russia with missiles, in alliance with Iran, which is about to create a nuclear device and supplies Russia with Shahid drones, and with support to a certain extent by China, once again a nuclear state. What does it mean for the uh, security architecture in the world, this example of just get your nuke and you can do whatever you want? Yeah, it's it's very worrying, of course, um, because the 
I would say global nuclear order is expecting uh, from nuclear weapon states at least to be what we call responsible. And so they are not supposed to use their nuclear weapons in uh, a way of aggressivity and what we call uh, aggressive sanctuariz sanctuarization. And so meaning trying to conquer a part of a country under the umbrella of their own um, nuclear weapons. And unfortunately, uh, so we are now at a new stage, I would say, of international politics and also deterrent theory. And we have to think about new ways uh, to prevent such crises to happen again. And so, of course, everyone is thinking about uh, China and Taiwan. Uh, even though the Russian nuclear doctrine is very different from the Chinese nuclear doctrine, uh, China has a smaller arsenal and they have a policy of no first use, uh, meaning that they say that they won't use their nuclear weapons um, except if they are attacked uh, by a nuclear weapon state and only in retaliation. So it's different uh, from the Russian uh, nuclear doctrine and also from the French or the UK and for, or from the US. Um, but of course, many nuclear thinkers and the scholars are thinking right now about what, how, what can we do uh, to prevent uh, some, so, such a thing to happen again? And how can we convince, in fact, I mean, it's an easy thing to say as a researcher from a nuclear weapon state, um, but how can we still try to uh, reduce the role of nuclear weapons in global conflicts, in this high intensity warfare context? And how can we convince that, in fact, countries like Ukraine, but also South Korea, Japan, uh, the Saudi Arabia, that nuclear weapons are, in fact, not, to, not really the solution? And um, that we should better work on, you know, reinforcing uh, the texts and all the um, legislative uh, framework and the United Nations and, and so on. But, yeah, it's a very daring situation. <laughs> Indeed. And I would say, like, if I would have been like a South Korean or a Japanese politician, I would say, yes, the United Nations uh, is great. But as long as we have Russia in the UN yeah. uh, Security Council and as long as Russia demonstrates what they do, oh, I don't particularly uh, trust the United Nations to okay. solve my problem when I will be attacked. But uh, before we go in further into this, uh, into this aspect, uh, can we stay a little bit more on this Iranian uh, ground? And we have seen recently Iranian attack, you have mentioned it, on the sovereign territory of Israel. Most missiles have been intercepted in the air. Many of them have not even reached the territory airspace of Israel. But still, it was a pretty strong statement. Uh, how does Israel perceive Iranian threat? And what are Israeli instruments? We have already seen Israeli airstrikes on Iranian nuclear objects um, last years. We have seen an ident unidentified cyber attack on uh, Iranian facility, which many attribute to Israel. But still, Iran is, as you said, is about to create a device, and Israel knows that it will change the balance of powers in the region. What is the future of this dilemma? Well, for the moment, uh, I would say that Iran, as I said, has all the technical means uh, to create a nuclear device, but it's not about to do so. I mean, they're able to do it if they want to, uh, but we don't see any signs of what we call the militarization and the arsenalization of the nuclear program, and we don't see either any political willingness uh, to do so. And for sure, as soon as uh, the international community, the International um, Atomic Energy Agency or intelligence services will be sure that Iran is going to cross a threshold and to develop a nuclear device, I would say that they will act. And so, of course, it will be Israel maybe first, with or without the support of the United States. And I would say this is the most important question, um, because um, I would say that the next Democrat president in the U.S. might not help uh, Israel to create damages, um, long-lasting damages and, let's say, efficient uh, damages against uh, nuclear facilities of Iran. Uh, but a Republican candidate and a Republican president, such as Donald Trump, might do so. 
And for the moment, even the Israelis themselves acknowledge that they don't have the um, uh, military means to create long-lasting damages uh, to Iranian nuclear facilities. Um, it needs, you know, b b um, uh, busters, um, bunker busters, and busters bombs, so bombs that are able to penetrate deeply in the nuclear facilities. And they also need to avoid uh, all the anti-aircraft defenses um, in Iran. And of course, uh, they need um, uh, tankers and U.S. Uh, tankers to refuel in flight uh, the, um, the, the planes. And so they, so they say themselves that they can't do it alone and by, this, them, by themselves. And so the question is, will the U.S. help them? But... Also, Israel still have the capacity to do covert actions. You mentioned the um, cyber attack again, uh, one facility is something that they could do again. Um, they could also resume their policy of targeting uh, nuclear scientists. But by doing so, if they are sure that Iran have uh, has a nuclear device, um, well, they will they might expose themselves either to a nuclear attack or to provoke Iran to go further in the nuclear program. And so it's really a question of risk. Uh, Israel is ready to take, and so the risk as, uh, the US is ready to take. And I don't think they would uh, do so if, I mean, before having exhausted all the diplomatic and economic pressure um, leveraged. And of course, I would also say that as long as the war in Gaza is not, at, I would say, as there is no ceasefire or at least a bit resolved, um, there is, I don't think, any, there is no hope uh, to try to advance on the nuclear program because the two issues are pretty connected. Um, Iran is positioning itself as a fierce defender of the Palestinians. And I, as I said, the US and Europe has lost a lot of credibility uh, in the Middle East because of the war in Gaza. And so, um, yeah, all these issues are very connected. Indeed, and uh, we know that uh, there is also no single approach on um, how to deal with Iran among the Western politicians, uh, especially if Donald Trump will be elected. There are huge discrepancies between the uh, huge distance between uh, the uh, U.S. approach by Donald Trump in particular and, for example, Germany's mm -hmm. approach by Olaf Scholz and um, his government. Uh, I'm not an expert in uh, French relations uh, to this uh, case, but I also can imagine that. A French approach would be different from what Donald Trump uh, would, uh, would would try to push. So when you don't approach Iran with a single uh, homogeneous front, uh, you most probably will not get the desired result. But going further to the region you have already mentioned, and in particular Russia, we know that Russia expands its presence, uh, the presence of its nuclear weapons, constantly claiming that they would have, or they have already, or that they will uh, deploy their nuclear-capable missiles, uh, Iskander, for example, closer to the borders of Europe, uh, for example, in Kaliningrad region, just 600 kilometers from Berlin, or let me say 400 kilometers from Warsaw. What are the risks of arms race and especially threatening with nuclear weapons in this confrontation? So I would say that Putin and the Russian officials are very aware um, that nuclear weapons are, of course, scary. And they are especially scary for countries that don't have nuclear weapons themselves. And so countries that are not able to engage in what we can call a deterrence dialogue and that are not able to um, try to manage by themselves um, nuclear escalation. And so that's why I think we've seen uh, Olaf Scholz being very, I would say, afraid <laughs> of uh, providing, for example, long-range strikes weapons to Ukraine, uh, while France has been a bit more vocal and uh, has demonstrated a bit more willingness on the on the on this matter and so we assess that this difference is due partly uh, to the fact that France has nuclear has nuclear weapons and Germany doesn't even though they welcome um, uh, US uh, nuclear uh, weapons on their on their soil and um, so this um, goal I mean, I mean, I think that there are already nuclear weapons in Kaliningrad and there are also uh, nuclear weapons in uh, Belarus. 
And so um, I would say that the, this deployment in Belarus is a bit more worrying than the one in Kaliningrad um, because it's the first time that Russia is deploying weapons, uh, nuclear weapons abroad. And even though they say uh, that uh, the control of nuclear weapons is uh, fully Russian, uh, well, we are never, uh, um, I mean, safe uh, from Lukashenko deciding to you know, he's fed up with uh, Putin and being a puppet of, um, of Putin. And they say, Hey, I have nuclear weapons on my, on my territory. Maybe I should do something with them. And so um, it's, so I, I say it's, um, a way to further deter, uh, uh, European countries, uh, to provide more support to Ukraine. And I would say that unfortunately, Germany has um, been quite receptive uh, to this pressure, but it's not the case of Poland. Uh, Poland, on, because they feel more threatened, of course, by Russia because of the shared um, because of the shared uh, shared uh, shared history. I would say uh, with uh, with Russia, and um, so Poland has been very vocal in their own willingness to welcome uh, U.S. nuclear weapons on their soil. And also uh, to acquire uh, long range um, uh, strikes uh, capabilities in order to be able to strike by themselves or Russia. Um, so I, I don't think it's, it's a fully good idea. Um, uh, but at least we see that Poland and also the Baltic states are not really answering to this uh, Russian pressure. And they are fully willing to stay committed uh, to support Ukraine and to uh, demonstrate that the only way of, um, you know, ending the war is uh, by Russian defeat. And um, so I would say it's up to us uh, Europeans not to be deterred uh, by these movements. And also, and it might be difficult, in fact, yes, not to engage me either in the in the number race, um, because. It's a bit difficult to assess uh, whether Russia would be able to keep up uh, with an arm race. And I would say the bet is on us. I mean, if we assess that the Russian uh, missile industry is not going to be able to keep up if, you know, the U.S., as it has been announced, um, deployed long range uh, strike missiles in uh, Germany. Uh, but Putin can decide to put all his financial means in developing a uh, new intermediate range, uh, conventional and nuclear missiles. And so we will engage in an arm race. So it's a difficult balance to find. Uh, uh, can we say that the approach to uh, nuclear non-proliferation, which worked pretty well for decades after uh, World War II, uh, only a few nuclear nations have emerged and very few were really thinking about obtaining nukes, that now this approach doesn't work anymore. Or is it just a matter of time? Because the technology is not that new. It is uh, literally 1940s uh, technology mm -hmm. if you produce the most simple yeah. bomb. Uh, and that this should have happened sooner or later. So it's 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 pretty funny because in the 60s, um, for example, uh, many U.S. analysts and researchers say that in the 2000s we would have 30 to 40 nuclear weapon states uh, because during this time uh, many uh, many nations were thinking about developing nuclear weapons. Uh, so, for example, in Europe, Sweden, uh, Switzerland. Uh, but also Brazil, Argentina, and uh, like more surprising countries. And as you said, ultimately, the non-proliferation uh, treaty was signed uh, in the early 70s, and it was efficient enough uh, to uh, uh, prevent uh, from further nuclear proliferation uh, because states sh understood that they would be better without uh, nuclear weapons uh, than being ostracized because they had uh, nuclear weapons. And it worked also because nuclear weapon states engaged uh, to help um, uh, non-nuclear weapon states to acquire nuclear energy, uh, so for peaceful purposes. They also say that they would reserve nuclear deterrence uh, to uh, nuclear weapon states, and so that never a nuclear weapon state would use its nuclear weapons to attack a non-nuclear weapon state and also that they will commit to a uh, nuclear disarmament. And unfortunately, I would say maybe the first pillar, so, so this pillar of nuclear energy uh, was, was more or less reached. Uh, but unfortunately, we see that now uh, the two other conditions of the NPT, so the fact that nuclear weapons would be used only against a nuclear weapon state, 
And um, what was the other way? And the fact that they will commit to disarmament are not fully respected. And so that's why countries, I mean, non-nuclear weapon states are easier tempted by the abolition of nuclear weapons. And so more and more countries are signing the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Or they are tempted, as we said, by nuclear proliferation themselves. Uh, so South Korea, Japan, um, Saudi Arabia. But uh, it's still very difficult, fortunately, uh, to acquire or develop uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, the risk of, I mean, no country wants to be North Korea. And the last example of a country that developed nuclear weapons is North Korea. And I don't think any country wants to become North Korea. And so maybe some are betting on the fact that they are too important to become uh, like North Korea. Maybe like, I, I think, for example, South Korea considers that the threat from North Korea and from China is high enough so uh, the international, com international community would understand it needs of nuclear weapons. Um, maybe Iran think that both uh, China and Russia will protect them, uh, them to, to become uh, like, uh, like North Korea. But it's a very dangerous bet. And so I would say that for the moment, the non-proliferation regime still holds. Um, but uh, nuclear weapon states really need to do more efforts uh, to show their willingness to go to disarmament and to reinforce these security guarantees. Uh, but unfortunately, we are not going to want that. Uh, if I may uh, ask this pretty bold, maybe stupid question, we have practically only one member of nuclear club, Russia, which openly threatens non-nuclear states with usage of nukes. And no, it has not been done by Vladimir Putin himself, but it has been done many times in prime time of Russia's state TV, and we know that none of such statements could have appeared without a personal approval of Vladimir Putin. So is, does it mean that the problem is very narrowly, can be very narrowly localized and this problem is Russia? I would say yes and no, um, because the, for example, the Iranian uh, nuclear file and their possible willingness to acquire a nuclear device um, is prior uh, to the war in Ukraine, situation in North Korea too. Um, but for sure, the fact that Russia is demonstrating such an aggressive uh, nuclear rhetoric and also is slowly uh, withdrawing from all arms control regulations that existed between Russia and the, and the United States, uh, like the New START Treaty, and uh, it also de-ratified the uh, CTBT, so the um, uh, Treaty Against uh, Nuclear Testing. And so it, it has a further damaging effect on arms control and on proliferation. Um, but as you say, the fact that uh, nuclear threats are so visible in the, in the media might be the most worrying thing, um, because... Of course, there is a discrepancy, a, um, a voluntarily discrepancy because, between what Putin says. Uh, in fact, Putin has shown some, I would not say restraint, but uh, at least he has not um, go. I mean, he has not um, uh, derived uh, from the official Russian doctrine when talking about nuclear weapons. Um, but as you said, he allowed uh, some commentaries. Uh, either from scholars or other television uh, to go <laughs> fully nuclear <laughs> and to really have um, a nuclear rhetoric that is not acceptable uh, from a nuclear weapon state. And the problem and what many thinkers are working on right now is that we don't know what will be the lasting consequence, the long lasting consequences of having a very visible and aggressive nuclear rhetoric in the media. Uh, on the nuclear doctrine itself. And also we have seen, I would say, a worrying uh, permeability in Europe uh, to our nuclear weapon threats. Um, a bit less these days and the past few months, maybe the journalist has finally learned about what it means uh, to do you know, strategic signaling. Um, but uh, in the first weeks and the first month of the one, I mean, the full scale invasion, um, as, I mean, each demonstration strike or test or each time Putin said the word nuclear it was on every TV channel 
news and it makes the front page of some newspapers. And me and my colleagues were like, we, you know, the journalists should, should not pay so much attention uh, to the nuclear threats and the nuclear rhetoric because it's what Putin wants. And so I would say there is also education uh, to do um, both in journalists but also in the public opinion, especially in the countries where there are no nuclear weapons, uh, to be less um, receptive of uh, these nuclear threats in order not to be deterred um, by um, a nuclear threat because we have to remind that, to remind that, but... Um, for the moment, we haven't seen any movements of uh, nuclear weapons, or except as, as as we talked about in Kaliningrad and Belarus, uh, but we haven't seen any sign that Russia is uh, going to use nuclear weapons against Ukraine, or even less against a nuclear weapon state uh, uh, or, or NATO NATO country, and so. Um, it's really a matter of public communication and, you know, not to be so receptive to fake news and informational warfare that Russia is so good at. Indeed, and Russia's uh, biggest and most important nuclear weapon is the threat itself, sure. uh, is creating the fear uh, among our politicians and deterring mm -hmm. us from actions. But even if we don't talk about the, the Russian case, uh, you have already mentioned a proliferation of weapons, which is an ongoing process, unfortunately. And um, what steps should be undertaken by the international community to at least slow down this process or in the past to stop it? So we are now in the end of uh, um, of July at the time of the recording, and it's uh, the PREPCOM, so the Preparatory Committee of the Non-Proliferation Treaty taking place right now in Geneva. And so we have delegates from the entire world gathered to try to answer this very question, uh, trying to uh, reinforce our uh, strategic uh, risk reduction and uh, non-proliferation regime. And so we see it's more and more difficult. Uh, but I would say first, uh, nuclear weapon states, so Western nuclear weapon states, except if China wants to join us, but I don't think so, um, have to do transparency efforts. And so a couple of days ago, uh, the United States released um, the full number of its uh, nuclear weapons arsenal, uh, full, num full inventory. I think it's a positive step. Um, also, there are some processes going on, so for example, uh, what we call the fail-safe review. And so how to show the world that, in fact, uh, nuclear weapons will be used only in very specific cases. And so the risk of involuntarily escalation is low. And I would say we also, even if it's, it's very difficult because of what's happening in Ukraine, we have to maintain a strategic dialogue within the P5. So the P5 are the five permanent members, uh, members of the United Nations uh, Security Council and also the five nuclear weapon states recognized by the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And so some initiatives are still going on, uh, either carried by uh, think tanks or governments uh, to assure that like Russian scholars, or Chinese scholars, French, UK and US scholars are, think are still talking to each other and trying to de decipher uh, what Putin has wanted to demonstrate and what is um, Chinese nuclear doctrine these days. And I think it's very important to be able to maintain this dual track on the one side, putting as much pressure that we can on Russia to stop the war in Ukraine and, and continue providing support to Ukraine. But on the other hand, also trying to build, to start building the world after the war in Ukraine. And we don't want um, nuclear weapons to have uh, a bigger place, uh, even a bigger place than now in the Russian doctrine as we've seen after the Cold War. And uh, I would say that it's an effort that's still to be, that has to be still carried on. Indeed. And um, as we know that international treaties are, in most cases, as good as the willingness of the participants to fulfill them. And in this case, everything depends on how can we convince the rock players on uh, the importance 
of uh, keeping the uh, promises they have made and fulfilling the treaties they have signed and ratified. And this process can take a long time and uh, request a lot of efforts and decisiveness. That was an interview with Aloïs Fayette, who is a research fellow at the French Institute of International Relations and head of the Deterrence and Proliferation Research Program. Her work focuses on nuclear proliferation in the Middle East, impact of emergent technology, strategic risk reduction, and doctrines of nuclear weapon states. Thank you so much for this uh, interview, Eloise. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel so you will never miss interviews like that.